Hi, my name is Ian Sanders. I've been lecturing here in the geology department of the for far too long, 40 years. And I'm just about to be put out to grass. I'm delighted that you've come along to learn a little bit about something that I've enjoyed studying. That is meteorites and what they tell us. Oh, sorry, come and, come and sit down in front here. I've got some specimens to show you if you want to. I'm just starting. I got interested in, in meteorites and what they tell us about how the Earth formed. And I'll be focusing on, on that subject for most of the talk. But I'm going to wrap up by taking a look forward in time to what is in store for us in the future. Now, I should say the object of this talk is not to tell you about how you apply the geology or what points you need. This is just an interesting, I hope, lecture for you to sit and enjoy. So if you don't want an interesting lecture and you want to a bit more about how you fill in the CAO form or whatever, then, then you don't have to say you can leave now. Okay. So let's just let's just head off into this talk and look at where we are in the in the universe. And this is a, an artist's impression. Come down and sit near the front so I can keep an eye on you if you're going to talk. So, for those of you who just come in, this is, this is, uh, there's more. Okay, let's, uh, so the, there we are, an artist's impression of the planets going around the sun. And what's that in the background, slanting uh, diagonally across that bright strip? Any ideas? Well done, it's the Milky Way Galaxy. That's someone knows the Milky Way Heavens. That's the Milky Way Galaxy. And the galaxy is something which we know a bit about because we can see galaxies, particularly through the Hubble Space Telescope. And here is two images of a galaxy, one before they fixed Hubble. Remember Hubble had a problem with the focus problem. Instead of us on the left, and they fixed it, there you are, with Earth resolution. And that galaxy is a bit like we think the Milky Way is. A huge Friday with most of the stars forming a big lump in the middle, and and then uh, other stars out in these spiral arms that they get from the middle. And if this were the Milky Way galaxy, then the Earth would be about three fifths the way out. There we are. It's about a hundred thousand light years in diameter. So a star on the far side, the light coming from that would travel for 100,000 years to go right through the middle and out the other side of the galaxy. And our sun is about somewhere like two-thirds, three-fifths of the way out. So 50,000 radius, and we're about 30,000 out. So we'd be in this rather more diffuse part of the galaxy out here. Okay. How many stars do you think there are in the galaxy? Well, it's a big number. And if you're a small child, a hundred feet, you would have to say thousands of feet. A hundred thousand would be a lot. Now you're really grown up, you can have you can really big numbers. hundred thousand million. Put them all together, that's 10 to the power of 11. That's the number of stars that are estimated to exist in our Milky Way galaxy. Our sun is just one of those hundred thousand million. So we're pretty, we're pretty in inconspicuous out there. But if you think that's you think that's inconspicuous? Look at this view. This is, again, from the Hubble Space Telescope, looking out right angles to this Milky Way, looking through between the stars and seeing what's beyond. And these little bright spots on this photograph, each one of those is a galaxy. And it's like looking through the size of a sand grain held as arm's length, tiny, tiny cone of light. And they focused on it for something like a fortnight with enough photons to make the image. And there we are, each one of those is a galaxy. And if we assume that each one of those galaxies is like our own, about 100,000 million stars, 
the lot of stars in the Not only that, but some of those galaxies are so far away that the light has been travelling to us since before our solar system even existed. Actually, you don't want to get too much into this space and time thing because you go mad. Because you can't really you just set the back down and just work in a very low environment, just done and it's pretty enough. So there we are. So it's nice to delve in a little, a little bit. Okay. So here's a little question. Here's a little question for those of you who like science. I've got here a piece of coal. Carbon. Now, I haven't weighed it actually a bit more. If that were 12 grams of coal, there would be quite a lot of atoms in that 12 grams of coal. Carbon. The question is, are there more atoms in this piece of coal in my hand? than there are stars in the galaxy, which is a bigger number. Star, star, sorry, stars in the universe. You know it's 100,000 million stars in the galaxy, and 100,000, I, I didn't tell you the truth. 100,000 million is the estimated number of these galaxies in the universe. So coming back to my piece of coal, are there more stars than you need for the universe? And there are atoms in this 12 grams of coal. More stars. More atoms. Ah, something. You were shut. You're, you're right. It's more atoms because 12 grams of coal, the atomic mass of carbon is 12. Okay? So 12 grams contains Avogadro's number of carbon atoms, which is 6 times 10 to the 23. Of carbon in this small piece of carbon. If we go back to our universe, we have 10 to the power 11 in one galaxy, and 10 to the power 11 galaxies, so it's 10 to the 22 stars. So there we are, there are more atoms in that. So it's surprising for all the universe is huge. When you go down scale, you, shrink, 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 you actually end up with even more things. Uh, on the small scale. So, so that's just by way of uh, setting the scene. We're pretty inconspicuous. Okay, there's the question and I've just given you the answer. So let's, let's switch to meteorites and what they tell us about the formation of our sun and, and the planets around it. So meteorites are chunks of rock from space and this uh, is a photograph of the fireball from the Bovidi meteorite that landed in 1969. Um, interestingly enough, uh, one of the pieces, two pieces were recovered. One of them went through the, f the roof of an RUC station just south of Belfast. 1969 was not a good time to be doing things like that. But when the specimen of meteorite was picked up, this is not that particular one, it's another one. You can see it's a little chunk of, of rock. It's quite heavy to pick up, quite dense and it's got a thin black skin on the outside. That's because traveling through space at high speed was melting away. That fireball was a trail of molten droplets left behind by the high speed trajectory of the rocks through the upper atmosphere. But interestingly, because they slow down gently as they decelerate, and because it takes time for the heat to get through the meteorite into the middle, the piece of rock that survives is not particularly hot. All the heat's dissipated in the fireball, and the light arriving on Earth is more or less as it was in space, intact. So, we can have a look at these meteorites. But before I show you what they're made of, whereabouts do they come from? That's an interesting question. And to answer that question, uh, experiments have been set up to photograph fireballs coming in. Now, you may think, how do you know when they're going? Well, we don't. So, a lot of money was spent and a lot of films since before, before we had CCTV and all the rest of it. Film, real film, was wasted. Yards and yards and yards of photographing the sky just in case, just in case. And NASA spent a lot of money. And in the 11th year, when they were just about to close the program, one of these obligingly came by and this photograph. Anyway, from these images, photograph is not responsible for two seconds possible to recreate the trajectory of the meteorite in space. And several of these 
In fact, probably several dozen by today have been investigated, and it turns out they're all going in big ellipses around the sun. So here's the sun in the middle. And there we are, there's the sun in the middle, and there's the orbit of Earth, Mars, and then out here the orbit of Jupiter. And between Mars and Jupiter, all these little black dots, the asteroids, the asteroid belt. And we're pretty sure that meteorites coming to Earth are fragments from the asteroid belt. And this is part of the evidence. They come on trajectories which go there, or not in circles around the sun, but these giant ellipses that go out past Mars, far as the asteroid belt, and back again. Okay, so they're bits of asteroid, and we know what asteroids look like because there's been a number of space missions gone quite close. Here's one of them. It's irregular sort of shape, not a sphere, and it's full of little, covered in little craters, a little bit like a big uh, potato that's been pockmarked with something. Okay, so we imagine something like this must have happened from time to time. Asteroids colliding with each other in space and breaking up, and the fragments from those collisions end up being sent off and coming to Earth it's us to, to study. Well, what are they made of? And some of them are made of metal. It's a shiny metal. It's got a pattern in it which shows up when the surface is polished and etched in acid. But it's basically a chunk of stainless steel. Well, it's made of metal. Iron and nickel are the main element. Mostly iron. Okay. So they are iron meteorites. And then we've got some meteorites which are like ordinary igneous rock we found in a basalt. <coughs> and this is a piece of basalt that came from space. So out there in the asteroid belt there's iron and there's basalt. But the great majority of stuff that comes, and this is the Bovidi meteorite, whose fireball I showed you at the beginning, it's been sliced and polished. And you can see it's got lots of little grains in it, it's like sandstone. Lots of little grains. And these are the commonest kind of meteorite. We think most of the stuff in the asteroid belt is made of this sort of material. It's called chondrite. And it's called chondrite because when it's looked at under a microscope, it's got little silicate spheres, about a millimetre or so across, and they're called chondrules. So the name chondrules comes from the word, the Greek word for seed, and so the name is given to the group of meteorites as a whole, chondrite meteorite. And all, oh, about 85% of the meteorites that come to Earth are this chondrite stuff. And chondrites are really interesting. And i just tell you a little bit about them. First of all, they're extremely old. This is a, a graph showing the ratio of lead to uranium in a zircon crystal on this axis and the age of the zircon crystal on that axis. Let me see if I can explain. This is, these are little zircon crystals. They're not from a meteorite, they're from a, a rock on Earth. But these zircon crystals contain a small amount of uranium. And uranium is radioactive with a very long half-life, so it's very, very slowly changing to lead. And we can measure, do experiments to measure how fast uranium is changing into lead. So if we know how fast it's changing, if we can then go and measure how much uranium is in one of these little and how much lead has accumulated, we can do a great, quite a simple calculation to work out the age of the zircon. This is very important because this is the basis of measuring the age of ancient rocks. So through time, the ratio of lead uranium increases. The older it is, the more lead and the less uranium. Okay. Well, here we are going back 4,500 years or so, and the ratio is one to one. So if something's as old as this, 4,500 years, the ratio will be one to one. I just want to let you listen to what uranium does when it changes to lead. The Geiger counter here, and in here, a little crystal of uranium oxide. That's the background radiation. It's normal, you're exposed to radiation the whole time. But not normally quite as intense as this. Yeah. 
Those are the dying screams of atoms as they change into, stop being uranium and change into lead. So you've heard it. Okay. So it turns out that meteorites are 4,567 million years old. There are little grains in those chondrite meteorites that contain uranium or contain uranium when they first form. They contain no lead when they first form, so we can assume that all the lead is generated from the uranium. And that age is now known even more precisely. <coughs> but the, the current point is 4567.2, plus or minus 0.1, something like that. Very, very precise. Amazing. Okay, so that's the age of the oldest stuff in the, in the solar system, and we think that's the beginning of the solar system. What else can I tell you about, about these chondrite meteorites? Well, they turn out to have the same chemistry as the sun. On this uh, graph, uh, you can see there's a, on the horizontal <coughs> axis is the composition of chondrite. There are several different kinds, but they're all broadly the same. Carbonaceous chondrite of type CI. And you can see on the top right, Common elements like iron, going down to the bottom end, rare elements like strontium and zirconium. And these numbers are orders of magnitude. So each number is a factor of 10 bigger than the one beside. Well, there we are in meteorites, but on the vertical axis, that's the sun. The sun's photosphere. And you can see one for one, a really remarkable correlation. So these chunks of rock from space. They've got the same uh, condensed elements, not the gases. They don't obviously stick around in a lump of rocks. So forget the hydrogen and the helium. Everything else makes solid materials with the same proportion in the sun. And that's the thing. Well, that's a possibility that they, the meteorites originally come from the sun. We've got to be a little bit careful before we jump to conclusions. Because maybe the sun. Maybe that's wrong too. But what we can say for definite is that they have a common origin, a common source of the sun and these hundreds of meteorites have been made out of what is essentially the same stuff. Now that's really interesting because the asteroids are out there past Mars, the sun's in the middle. So that's kind of telling us that the Earth as a whole is made of this hundred of meteorite. Actually, when you look at it in detail, this chondrite, I'll just pass this around. But you can see little bits of metal as well as the silicate grains. <coughs> but this one's gone a bit rusty. So the brown stuff is the silicate, you can't see the chondrules in it. So you pass that around, I trust you, whoever has it last doesn't make sure that bring it back to me at the end of the lecture, or I'll be in trouble. The museum curator. So this morning. Right. So little bits of metal and mostly silicate rock. Okay, here's, here's a question I should have posed to you first. How can we know what the sun is made of? It's not very easy to go and get a sample because it's kind of hot. But fortunately, the light that comes from the sun carries that information with it about the chemistry of the sun. This is the spectrum of sunlight that has been stretched out into a very long spectrum, going from red through to the purple end of the spectrum. And you can see various positions along the spectrum, little black lines. Each one of those black lines is called a Fraunhofer line, or an absorption line. And those lines are created when light uh, is absorbed by elements in the sun's outer atmosphere. So each line corresponds to an element. And looking at the blackness of the line, you can estimate how much of the element it is. So that's how we know the chemistry of the sun, and that's how we were able to show that graph that I gave. Okay. Well, this is how we think it all began. 4,567 million years ago, this was what the solar system was like. The newly formed sun in the middle of a big flat disk of dust. 
And within that disk of dust, small planets were beginning to form by gravitational instability. And these small planets amalgamated to make the big planets we have today. For some reason, it seems that in the zone between Mars and Jupiter, the asteroid, for some reason, a planet never materialized. And in that zone, we've got little bits of these baby planets still preserved. So when we look at meteorites, we're looking, if you like, at three planetary materials. Stuff that was on its way to becoming a planet but never made it. So, is this a reasonable picture to have? And I think astronomers would confirm that it's a very reasonable picture because new stars with disks of dust around them are now widely known in space. And in the galaxy, not just stars, here and there in the galaxy are huge clouds of gas and dust. And new stars are forming in these clouds and are possible to image stars with a disk of dust around them. So if we want to put the whole thing in, in a kind of a uh, diagram, we have these huge clouds of gas and dust, that's the blue cloud up there. A small bit of it becomes gravitationally unstable, falls in on itself, angular momentum is conserved, so it starts to spin and it ends up, like here, a new star with a disk of gas and dust around. That seems to be the pattern, and that's not just for our own solar system, but it's observed today in these cloudy, gassy regions elsewhere in our own galaxy. Okay. Now what about, what about that gas and dust? Where does that come from? Well, that's very interesting because it turns out that stars don't last forever and old stars explode. And this is a photograph of the Crab Nebula. It, it was a star in, in 1050 AD, and then it exploded, and it's been getting bigger ever since. And this uh, big cloud is dust, stardust, being shot back into the galaxy, being recycled. And this sort of process goes on all the time. Old stars lose mass, sometimes by the supernova explosion, sometimes by other processes, but old stars shed their dust back into the galaxy, and then the dynamics of the galaxy cause the dust to be kind of swept up and concentrated enough for the next generation stars to form out of the cloud. And, and to round the story off, about 20 years ago, objects like this were discovered for the first time in on bright meteorites. It's a tiny grain, it's only about five microns wide, and it's looked at under, under a scanning electron microscope. It's a little grain of silicon carbide. And it's nothing to do with the solar system, because it's carbon 12 to 13. It's the wrong number. All the carbon makes up you and the tables and lots of carbon around. It always has a ratio of 12 to 13, close to 89. There is a little bit because of fractionation, but not very much. This is way, way different. It's not part of the solar system at all. This is interpreted as a tiny grain, let's put the caption up there, a tiny grain of stardust that was made from an exploding star before the sun and planets even existed. So this is older than four five. And it's amazing you can actually extract these and handle them and know that they are from before the solar system came into existence. Okay. Just to go back to the iron and the basalt meteorites, where do these come from? Well, I didn't give you the evidence, but there is strong evidence that these first little planets that made wrapped up in the disk were radioactive. There was a lot of radioactivity in that dust in it. And that radioactivity caused the planets to get very hot. And they melted, some of them, not all of them. Chondrite ones didn't melt. But, but some of them did melt. And when you melt that uh, material, where's it got to? Just wait. Yeah. 
Okay, well, you can see little bits of metal, about 10% of it is little bits of metal. When that melts, the metal melts and forms a separate liquid from the molten silicate part, like oil and water. So the metal would sink down because of its high density and form a metal core in these small planets. And the, the silicate part would melt and can end up resulting in basalt coming up on the surface. <coughs> so the ones that melted give rise to the basalt and the iron. The ones that didn't melt, well, that's before like the melt. Okay, so we can we can jump from this to our own planet, planet Earth, as you know, as you've all learned. It's got an iron core. You all know that, don't you? But did you know why we think it's iron? Oh, no, because the geography book is cracked. It doesn't explain the interesting bit as to why we think there's an iron core. And that's why you come to Trinity, that's why you want to come to Trinity, because you find out the interesting science behind all these facts that you're just told to learn. It's just terrible, isn't it? That you just learn and not understand. Anyway, now you know why there's an iron core, because we know the Earth overall has the same chemistry that we see in the Sun and the asteroids. It has these little bits of metal in it because we see them in the chondrites. And so now that we know that that would be our core. Now, now you know, you can tell your teachers to teach that to the future generations so they're inspired, not just that they're just awful, having to just learn all this stuff. Okay. Well, I'm getting near to the end of my time, so I just want to look to Earth's future. And as you know, every day in the news, we hear trouble about the economy, trouble about dependence on oil, things that are running out, and really the whole of civilization is at a really quite an interesting turning point. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to say, first of all, there's going to be lots of effort to find more of these resources. Metals, building materials, fuels, and of course clean water. And, and my guess is that there's going to be employment prospects if you're a well-trained, well-qualified geologist. I would say that in, yeah, our last year's graduating <coughs> class, many of them, I think probably more than half of them, are actually exploration geologists in Australia at the moment. So if you like the idea of travelling and doing that sort of thing, then you can, I think, reasonably be reasonably optimistic in looking forward to doing that. But at the same time, I think it's worth looking at that last slide. A lot of what my generation have done, your parents did, you know, but we've been a little bit uh, easygoing and used things and thrown things away in a way which is clearly unsustainable. And I think the big challenge for your generation is to tread on the planet more softly. We've got to ease our way from the way we're living at the moment into a new way of doing things. And if you have a geological training, you will understand the need and the way of preserving clean water, for example. And, and uh, so the environmental side of looking after the planet will also benefit from having people around who understand how the planet works. So, it's a bit of a plug. You can either be on the side of God or the devil, depending on whether you like to make it nicer or just dig more holes and, and dig out more stuff, make more mess. But, but between, between now and the next few decades, I, I would like to hope that we are going into a transition where we will live more sustainably. And for all that it's rather frightening, I see the present economic situation as being part of this transition. And it's very important to hang on and hang in there and make sure we don't lose it all together along the way and, 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 and plan for a, a better future. So there you are, a little bit about the future of civilization up to the whole planet. The planet will carry on regardless of what we do. Okay, thanks very much for listening.